what is a benign parotid gland tumor? Pleomorphic adenoma, Warthin's tumor, monomorphic adenoma, interductal papilloma and oncocytoma, they are all basically called the uh, benign epithelial tumors of the parotid. Then you have the lymphangioma, cystic hygroma that is, and also you have um, the hemangioma, etc, etc. Now out of this, the Warthin's tumor is also called as the um, adenolymphoma, cystic papillary adenoma which is the other name given. So that way the adenolymphoma out of this becomes the benign parotid gland tumor. In the recent era, Bell's palsy is because of what? It is the HSV mediated cranial neuritis is the one which is implicated to be responsible for the LMN palsy that you see in the Bell's. Where do you have renal columns of Bactini? They are the uh, typical cortical tissues which will be driving into the medulla in the renal uh, hilum are called the columns of Bhaktini in the case of the kidney tissue. So A becomes the answer here. Now cryptic miliary tuberculosis, one of the challenging diagnoses because patients ESR may not be abnormal, MAN2 may not be there, AFB may not be there, still patient has got a fever for a long duration. Then you have done the bone marrow aspiration and there you can find the presence of the mycobacteria. So bone marrow aspiration and liver biopsy are the ones which will confirm the diagnosis in cryptic miliary TB and it is low grade fever and weight loss are the presenting features and it is more common in the elderly people, geriatric population, not the ones who are less than 40 years of age. So that way A becomes the answer here. This is an interesting question. Extrinsic allergic calveolitis. How to recognize this? What is the difference between that of the bronchial asthma and extrinsic allergic calveolitis. Do you find V's in that? V's is a feature of obstructive lung disease or restrictive lung disease, doctor? Obstructive lung disease. But extrinsic allergic calveolitis is a restrictive pathology which involves pneumonitis involving the lung. You don't find the V's, which is the differential diagnosis between any other obstructive pathology which also can be radiologically causing reticular nodular shadows just like the allergic calveolitis. But this is there means it is not um, extrinsic allergic calveolitis. That is how you basically clinically diagnose. It is also called hypersensitivity in pneumonitis. Farmer's lung, fanciers, bird fanciers lung, they are all the classical examples of it. It is caused by the thermophilic actinomycetes uh, is what need to be remembered. Patient presents with fever, chills, dyspnea, myalgia, non-productive cough, bibacillar valves, and uh, there is a restrictive disease if you happen to do the pulmonary function test there are non-branching central lobular nodular opacities uh, and reticular nodular shadows if you happen to do the high resolution CT scan like this there can be reticular nodular shadows this is the magnified view of the reticular nodular, nodular shadows and there are some major and minor criteria for you to basically diagnose it and there is interstitial inflammation with the fibrosis which lead to that restrictive pathology and uh, there are some important hints clinically before you diagnose extrinsic allergic alveolitis. It is an examination case in MD. Examiner will ask you, did you listen V's or not? You say V's is there, everything is there, I also got a small sheet of paper, extrinsic allergic alveolitis. Uh, generally in examination we should not make big, big diagnosis like this. Because extrinsic allergic allulitis is a diagnosis which you make after reviewing radiology, etc, etc, everything, after getting the laboratory reports. Before only, what is your first diagnosis, doctor, if the examiner asks extrinsic allergic allulitis, if you sit there, um, he will uh, drag you, like Draupadi being dragged in the exam hall. So, wheezing is not a clinical feature because it is obstructive. It is not obstructive. Isnophilia is not observed. Why? Because it is a type 3 and type 4 hypersensitivity but not type 1 hypersensitivity that you see in extrinsic allergic calvulitis. Similarly, histological isnophils are not commonly seen is what need to be remembered. Now, what is a potassium channelopathy? This is one question if you answered wrong, don't regret. But unfortunately, it will be right for you. Because uh, you never expected things happen. No? So, what is paramyotonia congenita, doctor? You have prolonged localized myotonia and weakness in them and it is an example of a sodium channelopathy. Now the question comes, I mean before we go to the next question because there is nothing to discuss on this question. 
How do you differentiate the classical myotonia from that of paramyotonia? Just like influenza, parainfluenza. Typically, doctor, if you do the muscle activity, the myotonia is the one which will aggravate if it is paramyotonia. But in the case of a true myotonia, congenital myotonia, it typically become decreased. That is a differentiating factor. One point about it. Then you have another important entity called familial hemiplegic migraine. Probably some of you must have seen first time this term in the exam hall. Am I right? So we don't see these cases that frequently unless DM neurology. So the classical migraine type which has got a hemiparesis, ataxia, coma, epileptic seizures associated and uh, uh, this is the second important entity. Now, you have got uh, uh, what type of channel which is abnormal here? Once more it is the sodium channel which is abnormal and uh, the calcium channel which is abnormal. Then the third comes the episodic ataxia. How do you describe this? It is autosomal dominant, ataxia will be there, myokinia will be there and it is an example of uh, a typical example of a potassium channelopathy that is the uh, episodic ataxia out of the all the options given A becomes the answer. Once more episodic ataxia type 1, type 2, 3, 4 that is called doing DM neurology. Then uh, luckily examiner didn't ask you is it type 1, 2, 3 or uh, first of all only you did not listen what is uh, uh, what you call episodic ataxia and all. I still remember examiner uh, when surgery exam case was given a case of hydrocell was diagnosed as hernia bias. On the top of it, examiner was asking, tell the types of uh, congenital hydrocele, non-congenital hydrocele. First of all, diagnosis itself was wrong, that uh, we were presenting a case as uh, hernia, when it was actually a case of hydrocele <coughs> in MBBS exam. The mistake is not ours. It was our first year PG who gave LIA patient who had it. There are two LIAs, LIA with hydrocele, LIA with hernia. <laughs> so that was the uh, LIAization, which uh, has led to the... <laughs> Entire uh, exam screwed up. So, that way. Let us go to the next question. Sternocleidomastoid atrophy, where do you come across? You see in Duquesne's muscular dystrophy, uh, the typical presence of a lobular carcinoma, do you see in postmenopausal or premenopausal women, doctor? It is the um, uh, women who have not reached their menopause are the ones who typically contain it. Now, critical temperature of N2O, 36.4 degrees Celsius, and the critical pressure. He is 72.45 bar. If you answered it wrong, nothing to worry. We can't remember critical temperature of all 10 gases. Difficult, right? But how many answered it right? Let me see our stalwart students. Is it a old question? No. Okay. Primary biliary cirrhosis. Is there any risk for hepatocellular carcinoma was the question. Point blank. Very much. There is a chance of 6% uh, increased risk. In the patients who have the primary biliary cirrhosis to develop the hepatocellular carcinoma, it is definitely a risk factor is what need to be remembered. Is there any keratoconjunctivitis sicca associated? Definitely. What is the underlying cause for the primary biliary cirrhosis? There are autoantibodies which are anti-mitochondrial which are attacking the biliary tree. They can also have the other autoimmune pathologies also in addition. That is the Jogren, the Raynaud's, sclerodactyly, telangiectasia can be the associated features. What are the most common presentation of endemic goiter? Generally a diffuse swelling of the thyroid is the presenting feature. In the case of infants, what is the most common cause? It is in the childhood, it is a Graves disease which is the most common cause for the development of thyrotoxicosis. In chronic renal failure, it is the multiple myeloma, vitamin D, excessive therapy and secondary hyperparathyroidism but will it lead to hypercalcemia or normocalcemia? Because secondary hyperparathyroidism act occurs as a consequence of hypocalcemic state until it becomes normalized. So let us check between primary and secondary hyperparathyroidism. Now history of trauma, engorged veins, hypertension, back triad, cardiac tamponade is what you typically come across. Contact time for the chlorination is around one hour. All of you know very well. Now how does azygous vein develop doctor? It is the union of the ascending lumbar veins with the right subcostal vein at the level of the 12th thoracic vertebra that the azygous will be originating so the lumbar vein should be the answer. And um, how does azygous vein, what does it be connecting? It will be connecting the 
inferior vena cava with the superior vena cava. Why do you require that connection? There is no azygous artery, no, which will connect the descending iota with the ascending iota. Embryologically, I mean, uh, if you look at it, iota nicely descends down. While descending, it won't create, provide space for the SVC, IVC to be in continuity. Right? So, in order to provide that continuity, you have this azygous vein, which is being developed embryologically is what need to be understood. Okay. The aneurysm in the brain, when it ruptures, it can lead to vasospasm, it can lead to intracranial hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, they all can be the complications of it. Let us talk about fracture scaphoid. Is it proximal portion or distal portion which will undergo avascular necrosis, doctor, in the fracture scaphoid? It is involves the proximal pole which is much more likely to lead to the, to undergo the avascular necrosis is what need to be remembered. Functional cast bracing is what we use. When there is a comminuted femoral shaft fracture, we also use it for the fracture of the humerus and also in the case of the fracture of the tibia but not the fracture neck of femur is um, uh, what I like to underscore. Now acute fulminant hepatitis, what is the most common cause? Hepatitis B. What are the non-hepatitis viruses which can lead to it? Especially pediatric population. Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, varicella joster, herpes virus type 1 and 2 and uh, parvovirus, any of them can cause. It is except about it. Eh? Okay, okay. Anyway, you have the list of that. Herpes virus type 1 and 2 and 6, parvovirus, adenovirus, paramyxo, varicella joster, Epstein-Barr and CMV. Any of them can lead to that. Paramyxo is not, is there. Varicella is there. Herpes simplex. Uh, okay. Infectious mononucleosis also was there. Okay. Uh, once more, I am not sure what, what, what was there in the examiner's mind. Then re renal stones is a complication, especially with uh, jonisamide. Around 4% of adult population can develop uh, the renal stones. 